right, so I want to go over the agenda. We're going to do introductions around the room here, and then there'll be a little bit about CRLL, and then we're going to introduce our esteemed presenter today, Dr. April Legou. Thank you so much, Dr. Legou, for <laughs> being here. And then Dr. Legou is going to uh, give us a presentation on uh, single subject research design, and then we're going to have a group discussion regarding the principles, application, and other elements of the research approach. And then we'll have some closing remarks at the very end. Um, so if we can go around the room, and I, I don't have a great order, and I know everyone has a, a slightly different view here in Zoom, so don't be shy. And if you'd say your name, your agency, or university affiliation, and any burning questions you have about single subject research design, that you're coming in with today or your interest in this approach, that would be great. Who would like to start us off? I'll go first. So my name is Rakesh Maurya. I'm a doc candidate at the University of Wyoming. Um, I'm from India, basically. And um, what was the other thing? Um, I'm very much interested in research and I'm doing research minor in, in both qualitative as well as quantitative research in my program. Uh, already working on several manuscripts, but this is the one area where uh, I have not had any classes here at the UW. So, I mean, I had classes on, on uh, case studies, but I was really interested in like, how does it look like when you talk about single case um, you know, research design? So that was the reason why I'm really excited and interested in this webinar and learn it. All right, and welcome. I, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I go first. Uh, my name is Kotman Ng, and um, I'm the initiator of CRLL. <laughs> with Doc students and with Chris, that we, we, have, we have done most of the legwork. We have created this space. Uh, I, I'm just going to be here for a brief moment because this is our second webinar to really to feel the excitement together with you guys. And uh, we thank uh, April, Dr. Lagu, who's my colleague, and <laughs> one, uh, has accepted the invitation to come and speak to, uh, to, to share this space in, in promoting research among counselors and also to bring the counseling profession a little bit closer together through the through this platform. And I'm so excited, so thrilled and grateful that we have participation from across the country. And hopefully someday soon we will have international participants. That's our goal as well towards the end. And I uh, appreciate that once again and enjoy it. And please tell your colleagues about us, about us and because we, we don't want to have a large number, we want to maintain a very intimate conversation space. So it's, if they want to participate, they have to get on to the registration as soon as we roll things out. And the next one in, in Ju July, I'll be talking about professional development and internationalization and what it means to add an international dimension to our professional identity and professional development. So I will see you or anybody else very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ng. <laughs> I'll go. Yes. Um, my name is Hannah Akwe. I am an assistant professor of counseling in Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. I was part of the first um, webinar, and so I jumped. You could put me in on this one, well, but I'm also research to the master's students. And many times, I feel like I'm the only voice letting them know the importance of research. So, single case study seems like it's doable at the master's level. So, I want to figure out how experts in the field have done it, so I can incorporate that in my class because. Every student, even from those who are very practitioner oriented, can understand how they can track clients' improvement or decrease and advocate for why a certain modality works for them or not. So that's why I'm here. Thank, Thank you, you here. Hannah. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being an advocate. So next, um, hi everyone. My name is Denise Walker. I am a recent graduate. I just uh, completed my PhD at Texas A&M 
University of Commerce. Yay! Yay! Yay. That's awesome. <laughs> We're celebrating for yeah. sure. Yes, and so I'm applying for jobs now. By the way, I graduated with my PhD from Texas A&M Commerce. <gasps> what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm applying for jobs, and I've taken one class, um, and this was maybe a couple of years ago, and we kind of studied the concept of single case design, but we didn't, I mean, it was just kind of an overview, so when I saw it come again, uh, come up in my email, I was saying, oh, I'm interested, and I agree with Hannah, I think this is one of those um, designs where you can help students to really understand the importance of research, especially in the master's program, because sometimes just their research class is... One of those things that we just try to get in and get out of. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Some numbers, guys. So yeah. um, I appreciate you all hosting this event. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Walker. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's great. I can go next. Um, I'm Courtney Alvarez. I'm an assistant professor in the professional counseling program at Carlo University, which is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I've had a little bit of exposure to single case study design at conference presentations, a little bit in my doc program, but not much. Um, and so I have a couple of very small grants where I'm doing some experiential learning in um, training some of my students. And so I want to try to do a little bit of single case um, study design to measure that. Awesome. Thank Great. you. Welcome. Hi, I can go next. Uh, I just got done watching the first video on YouTube. Thank you for posting that. I really enjoyed that. I wasn't able to attend the first one. Um, but my name is uh, Dr. Chad Yates. I'm an associate professor over at Idaho State University. Um, I really had a strong interest in this, uh, dating back to, I think, a lot of the, uh, I think, ACES presentations I've gone through on this topic, and then also, uh, you know, I think there was a JCD article that came, uh, I s actually, have, uh, not an article, a volume that came out with multiple kind of articles on single case research design that I've really liked. I've done uh, two fairly intensive single case research design investigations and currently uh, finalizing the uh, discussion and the data analysis in one. And I've always, I think, um, it's such a, a interesting kind of um, analysis and uh, data methodology that I'm just really curious about l learning all I can so I can kind of do the best in future investigations as well. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Gates. You probably have something to teach us too, I imagine. Oh, no, very <laughs> much. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Yates with Y A T E S. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chase Pease. Um, I'm a clinical assistant professor in marriage and family therapy at Virginia Tech. Um, so we're, we're part of a human development and family science program here. And I'm the clinic director at our family therapy center. And that um, program, we're training, training our doctoral students um, in marriage and family therapy. So we're part of a co-amp accredited program. Um, but we're also um, starting um, a partnership with Brigham Young University, where we're joining the Family Therapy Practice Research Network. And so I think single case study and single, single study design will be something that's interesting as we kind of think about the data that we're going to be collecting on a clinical basis. And I just want to say my internet connection has been going out, in and out, since I've been in here. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to stay the whole time, but I hope so. Okay. So I thank you. And I, I missed your name. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. It's uh, Janine Case Pease. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Christian Chan. I'm an assistant professor of counseling out in Idaho State University. Um, I'm uh, in terms of uh, single case research design, it is something that I remembered being exposed to mostly through my own self-interest and um, and exposure by reading um, scholarship and research around single case research design, but not actually having um, outside of going to conferences and professional development outside of my doctoral training, there wasn't really much. So. Um, and also, I'm very much 
I'm just gonna say I'm very much a research nerd so I'm like somebody who gets excited about research like all day long and research methods so um and I like the the ways that I can um, use some of that professional development to think about how do I um, perhaps think about the services that I'm providing not only to clients and students but also in the way that I'm training um, future professional counselors and um, future professional counselor educators. So um, certainly thinking uh, very much in this big broad systems perspective in the ways that we we all can make an impact with. Um, specific research methodologies. So thanks so much for doing this. Thank you for being here. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. Thank you everyone for uh, great introductions. It's so exciting to have such bright academic minds here at CRLL. And as Dr. Ung said, uh, the, the purpose here is to create a space where we can further learning and, and advance the conversation and the topics of research and, uh, and leadership in the professional counseling community. And we have such wonderful minds in the field. It's great to be able to get together and, and share those topics. And uh, we also believe in posting the webinars for free so they could be a little light in the darkness as folks uh, develop classes and work on dissertations or other research and just work in the professional counseling field and especially around the, the topic of outcome research, which we're focused on here today. Um, Dr. Ong. Oh, you're muted, Dr. You're muted. Yeah, I tried to click on the wrong, 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 I'm new it. Okay, I found it. So I, I will, <laughs> I'll have a bit farewell and to and enjoy yourself and have fun and thank you for your support. Yeah. Counseling world is closer together. Um, yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Ong. All right. So it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. April Legu. Dr. Legu is an instructor at Oregon State University. And prior to her current appointment, she was an assistant professor at California State University in Bakersfield. Also, Dr. Legu has been a school counselor and a teacher. She received her undergraduate degree from California State University in Chico, her master's in educational counseling from California State University in Bakersfield and her PhD in counseling from Oregon State University. Dr. Legu, nope. has, yeah, all right. <laughs> That's my plug, yeah. OSU. Beaver believer right there. Beaver. <laughs> uh, Dr. Legu has taught graduate level counseling courses in 20 different topic areas. She's utilized a single subject research design in her dissertation and in her article, which is currently out for publication, the impact of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy on math anxiety in adolescence. Personally, Dr. Legu, her manuscript was shared as an exemplar in one of my research classes, and I was so struck by the um, clarity through which the, the method was, was introduced and discussed and applied that I wondered why the method wasn't being used more widely. Um, and it's, it's a method I plan on using as I move forward with my dissertation. So. I'm super excited. I'm extra excited today. So please <laughs> join me in welcoming her. I'm so excited to learn from her today, Dr. April Legu. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that amazing introduction. I've never been introduced like that before. I feel so special. <laughs> it, it really makes those hundred years of school worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can share your knowledge in hopes that others will use it to be able to advocate in the counseling profession. So that's really why I'm here today. All of my materials that I share with you, you they're yours to have and use uh, as much as you want um, from here. If you want to present them in your classes and those kinds of things, I encourage you to do, do so. Um, so I'm really interested and fascinated that we have, how many do we have? Six, seven? I can't see everyone on my screen. How many do we have, Chris? Let me put this well, let's see. I think we have, I'm a counselor, so I don't do math, but that's a joke. Wait, uh, is that math anxiety to your Yeah, house? a little bit. I need some <laughs> CBT on that one. Right. Mindfulness. Six or seven. I'm just yeah. so, I appreciate you all being here. On a Saturday morning, mm -hmm. at the end of the school year, yep. talking about research. And so that, that in itself if, if we don't make it past 918, I'm going to be a happy camper. <laughs> happy 
because of that. Because it shows me there are people in the world that want to promote research and advocate for our counseling profession. So first and foremost, thank you. And I appreciate all of you. And thank you, Chris, for this. Thank you, Dr. M, for inviting me to do this. Um, as Chris said, I am an instructor here at Oregon State University. And um, I'm the newest addition to the clan here. Uh, I just started in August. And so it's a very exciting time um, for everybody because our program's growing and just it's really wonderful. So um, today we are, I'll have a PowerPoint that I can show. And we're going to briefly recap uh, Dr. Foster's a few of her slides to just give the basic um, what is single subject research design. Um, to give you this sort of underlying foundation. My assumption is that you are either in the first webinar or that you're able to watch the first webinar. Um, so we're just gonna sort of run through those quick slides. And then what we're going to do is get into an actual case. And just actually from start to finish, let's dive in and help this counselor create a design, go through a study, analyze the results, report the results so that this counselor can make change. Or, which is ultimately why we do research, right? To create positive change um, in our field. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, move all of my, have all my coffee and my water and all of that fun stuff around me. So I'm ready. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. That's all good. And, and Chris, will you let me know if people have raised hand or there's a chat question or those kinds of things? And like Chris said, at the end, we'll have a discussion. My hope is that you will see, um, go through this, this process with me all together. And then at the end, you have ideas of your own project that you want to do that maybe collectively we can all sort of just have this discussion as far as moving forward with your own designs and issues you come in, in contact with and those kinds of things. So let's go ahead. And, mm, I'm assuming everyone can see that. And if they can't. They would let me know, right? <laughs> okay. So, all right. Everyone, all good? With that, everyone can see. I'm assuming, because I can't see any of you. So, here we go. All right. So, single subject research design. And like we said, Dr. Linda Foster uh, went over the a, in a very clear, concise way, the foundational understanding of single subject research design. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna address some unique issues within the field of counseling. And like I said, we're going to be going through an actual example to address those. A little bit about me, because sometimes it's important to know about the researcher. Um, I am, like Chris said, a former school counselor, graduated um, from Oregon State University, cohort 62. Uh, I've taught courses in research, human development, social justice, counseling theories since 2008, um, all the way from a TA to assistant um, to instructor, and we'll soon be transitioning over to assistant clinical um, professors in the next year. Um, so these may be your memories of research in high school, I mean in grad school, not school in grad school. Um, I know that some of them were mine. <laughs> so read, write, rinse, and repeat the research cycle. And this is oftentimes why we don't get people um, interested in research. And so a lot of you, when you were introducing yourselves, you talked about how, you know, I, I'm really excited about research. I don't know why there's not more research out there. Um, and really, I think it is because we just have this sort of, um, and I don't know if it's media driven or comic driven or or what, but this like research is really just for certain people that really fit into the certain niche and have this love for research and those kinds of things. And um, I think that it's all about finding the right fit for what works for you and um, not getting so overwhelmed by how am I going to analyze the results? Because when people think of research, so many times they think of uh, statistics and analyzing results and those kinds of things. And so it's scared, in my experience, it scares people away from the field of research because so much of research is design and implementation and choosing participants and going through proposals and there's 95% of is that. And then we have this 5% of analyzing data. Um, and ironically, that's the 5% uh, 
piece that typically scares people away from research. So um, my hope here today is to spread that, the love of research instead of the fear. Um, so again, we're gonna be recapping um, some SSRD basic, uh, basics from Dr. Foster and addressing specific issues to single subject design. A case example, specifically we're going to go through establishing a clear criteria for measurement of behaviors. So how do I measure those behaviors? What does that look like? What do I use to measure them? Those kinds of things. Um, what are my options out there? Validity threats and how to address those. Uh, one of the controversies, I, I will say, of uh, single subject design is that um, a lot of times people say we, they have a lot of external and internal validity threats. And so we'll talk a little bit about that and how to address those threats to um, decrease them and increase your result on productivity. Establishing stability in the baseline. And this is another one that um, because single subject design is looking at behaviors and the participant acts as their own control, it's really important to establish a stable baseline um, with regards to the behaviors that you're seeing before you implement the intervention. Talking a little bit about that 5% of analyzing data, uh, one of the things that draw is, is very, um, uh, that draws people to single subject is the um, feasibility of being able to analyze the data and report the data to um, people who, uh, populations who aren't maybe statisticians or someone who's not well versed in reading quote unquote T-scores and data and statistics and those kinds of things. So being able to analyze the data in a way that is um, efficient and, and you're able to um, uh, talk about it and discuss it in an informal format with regarding policy and changes in um, implementation of different strategies and things like that on a, on a program level. Um, Analyzing the data in this piece is, is a really big strength of single subject research design. And then reporting results, which goes along with analyzing data when you're in a um, professional field, you need to know how to report the results because as we all know, um, there are a lot of really, really good studies out there, a lot of really wonderful ones that aren't, the results are not being reported in a way other than in a in a journal. So if you're not going out and reading the journal article, you're not really getting the research. But on the other hand, there are lots of, there's lots of research that I guess quote unquote research in the media that um, is not that great as far as research design and those kinds of things. But the way that it's reported, just people draw are drawn to it. So, so much of the, of the research, in, especially in our field of counseling, it's about not just analyzing the results, but also reporting the results. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that too. And Chris, um, I tend to go off on tangents and soapboxes and all of those fun things. So if you could keep me on track, because I don't want to okay. uh, keep these, keep these no people worries. and wonderful researchers, you know, till tomorrow. Um, and again, you're going to, this PowerPoint will be available to all of you. So. If I'm rushing through it, I apologize, slow me down, ask questions, but ultimately you'll have the whole thing in your inbox pretty soon because Chris will be sending it to you, <laughs> I'm assuming. So um, all of us know, and, and again, I'm just talking to our crowd um, after your introductions and I got to know a little bit about you. It sounds to me like most of us know sort of the basics about what single subject research design is. Um, the advantages of it. And again, this is from Dr. Foster's um, presentation that I want to recap. Um, the big one here is that it's it can be individualized for each client or group of clients. And it's really important in a counseling field, the counseling setting, because all of our counselors, all of our counselees, clients are individuals. And um, so it's very important to keep that in mind in single subject research design just fits so nicely with that. Dr. Lagu, I'm sorry yeah. to stop you here. I'm still no, seeing the, the first title slide and I'm not sure. Have you moved into the PowerPoint or? Um, I have. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that, are other okay. folks still just seeing the first 
Um, okay, so we're we're on that title slide. Woo, you are. Uh, okay. Are we here? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I think well, I we're, showed we're, those slides. <laughs> yeah, we're caught up there. Okay. Did you see this one? Nope. Oh, so that wouldn't. Yeah, so you probably had no idea what I was talking about when I said <laughs> <laughs> read, write, rinse, yeah. repeat, and research cycle. Um, so I'm just going to keep it like this because mm -hmm. this seems to be working, and I can see everybody in this format. When I had it on full screen, I couldn't see anybody. So if this works for everybody, then we'll just continue to move forward with that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chris, for letting me know that. Sure Why you're here? You're wonderful. All right. So um, recapping, I'll just kind of slide through those and our advantages. And this is where we were at. Um, immediate evaluation of interventions allowing quicker changes to treatment plan. That's a really huge one in counseling. Um, why single case designs are um, pos a positive thing in, in counseling. So I, we're going to run through some of these designs. We have our A, B design, which essentially is no intervention applied, which is the um, baseline. And then we have the intervention, this A, B phase. And that's it. There's the intervention, um, and then we're done. Um, then we have the A, B, A design, where you have your baseline, established baseline, your treatment, and then you go back to your baseline. So this intervention is really good with, inter, um, or excuse me, this design is really good with interventions that look at lasting change in behaviors. So, for example, if you um, have a student who, and I'll just use this example, has high math anxiety, um, and you, you see that baseline, then you do the intervention. You take the intervention away because the intervention was meant to decrease lasting behaviors of anxiety. And so then you have that baseline and you want to see if it went back down. In this case, the anxiety went back up or it stayed the same or got better. So, um, and today we'll be looking at the ABA design. And then we have the ABAB design. And I'm not even gonna go into the ABAB, ABAB, ABB design. <laughs> that was just, a, that was a single subject joke. <laughs> okay, so ABAB design. Um, is essentially, again, baseline intervention removal and then uh, the interventions applied. And so this way you have an opportunity to say, yep, every time that intervention was applied, that behavior changed. And we had two baselines. And so in that case, um, you would be able to show the validity of that research study. And then we have multiple baseline, which we'll be looking at today. So we will be looking at an ABA uh, multiple baseline concurrent design. And I know that's a huge mouthful, but really what that means is that there are going to be more than one participant and we're going to have an intervention and then be done with the intervention. And that's pretty much it. So I know it, when it comes across, it's single subject, concurrent, multiple baseline design, and it makes whoever says it look really smart and amazing because it's such a mouthful, but really, we're just giving an intervention to a few students. Um, so it's important with your grad students to simplify those terms because you don't want them to say, oh my goodness, there's, they will shut down. When you have that mouthful, they will shut down. And so looking at it and, and simplifying it in a way that is, yeah, you, you know, you really can do this. It's, it's important. So let's, that was our recap. Any questions with recap? as far as just basic foundational elements of, all right, let's move on. Um, so we have a case study and my hope is that we can work through this case study together. And so um, let's look at Angela. And I used professional school counselor in this case and I don't think we have any school counseling participants, but I know you all will be in interaction with school counselors at some point in your a professional career because you're in counseling. And so I think this is uh, applicable to you all as well. But please, you can always transfer this to clinical setting, community setting, those kinds of things. So Angela's a professional school counselor, ninth grade at a high school in um, a rural town in California. Um, her first six months as a freshman counselor, she notices the following. 35% of her freshman students were failing their freshman algebra class. 35% of them, 90% of them were doing well in other classes. 
So as a new counselor coming into this high school setting, Angela's wondering what's going on here and how can I figure this out? Yeah, I can look at the grades and compare them and show them in a meeting and those kinds of things, but what am I gonna do about it as the counselor? Because as a professional counselor, that's our role. How are we gonna advocate for our students? So there were some informal interviews with students that Angela had. Um, suggesting testing anxiety specifically in math and those were just sort of um, side conversations nothing that was formal or documented um, and then further investigation into the math anxiety literature because angela says okay i know they're having math anxiety how do i help them suggests that cognitive behavioral therapy was effective in decreasing anxiety in her students so here's our case. Here's our case of Angela, the counselor, who has students coming in that are suffering from math anxiety, and she's in a position to be able to help. So that's where we're at. Um, so I'm going to address the following through this case example of the concurrent multiple baseline across subjects. We'll establish the clear criteria for measurement of behaviors, validity, establishing stability, analyzing the data, looking at the general generalizability of the results, and then the reporting of the results. So let's get back to Angela. So she approached, this is real life, she approached her administrator, her supervisor, and expressed her concerns over the issue of math anxiety. Hey, supervisor, I have these students and these students, and this is what I think is going on after having conversations um she expressed that she wanted to propose this intervention principal responded you need evidence you need evidence to show the board to request funding so why do i put catch 22 there this is often a problem that researchers run into don't forget to unmute your microphones if you talk catch 22 she needs funding to get the uh, evidence. Right, exactly. So thank you for that. Um, so she needs to perhaps buy materials or um, sometimes as uh, professors, we have to buy, buy our, our classes or as practitioners, we have to just have time to do those things. And that a lot of time requires funding. So now what did she do? What does Angela do as a counselor without funding, knowing there are these problems, having these roadblocks, and her supervisor says, show me the evidence. So she immediately thought, and this again is something that counselors and practitioners think of when they think of a traditional exper experiment. Oh my goodness. How am I going to show evidence without funding? How am I going to do this when it's just me? How, you know, when I think of when people think of, especially grad students, think of research, they think of labs and lots of people and lots of grant funding and this is what you do all day and controlled groups and experimental groups and all these fun things. Um, and then Angela sitting alone in her office saying, I have no time, I have no money, I'm a practitioner. And then we cue some panic mode right there. And this right here is where it stops in the field. This is it. This is where the, the panic and the anxiety say, oh, maybe I can just choose something like this on my own and with my students, but not track it and those kinds of things because I'm not an, a researcher. Every clinician is a researcher. Every school counselor is a researcher. Everybody is a researcher. If you've ever asked a question in your life, you're a researcher. So it's really important to normalize that um, for our students. <clears throat> So, single case, multiple baseline design to the rescue. Um, and when I say research, I don't mean Google, <laughs> which is what a lot of our millennials feel like we have, <laughs> which oftentimes does answer a lot of our problems. <laughs> but to show evidence, Google's not enough. So she decided to dust off her textbook and get, get moving. I'm gonna do this. So let's help her. Let's help her through the process. So there are three phases that we have in creating this study, going through this study. 
Um, phase one is the biggest chunk. And like I said, those analyzing results and reporting results are the smaller pieces, but planning that study is the biggest chunk. Because if you want great results and a great study, you have to just spend so much time planning. And so, again, oftentimes that is some, a, a roadblock that comes in with clinicians say, oh my goodness, there's so much to do. So having a systematic approach helps, um, but it's really important to focus the energy on the planning. So we go through these steps. Um, we'll review the literature, intervention, look at our research design that's appropriate, create a hypothesis, and then we're gonna measure the effectiveness and look at participant selection. How do we even get participants for this study? Um, and then we're gonna look at accommodating internal external validity and then phase one will end when we submit to IRB. All right, so reviewing the literature. So Angela went out and she said, I don't know enough about math anxiety. I know my students have it, um, but I need to research it. So in her literature, she found that math anxiety actually can be externally influenced by attitudes of math presented in teachers. So she said, ooh, Maybe there's a study I can do where I can ask the teachers, you know, what's their math anxiety, which is a future study of hers. <laughs> uh, then she's asking, what is the longitudinal? Why should I even care? Why should I even try to make change? Because is there a longitudinal impact? And then she found out throughout her research in her literature that there actually is avoidance of majors in um, college, avoidance of career paths, and those kinds of things. If you're familiar with STEM at all, um, science, technology, engineering, and math, we have this huge push in the school system and it, um, just society as a whole to increase our STEM exposure experience education. Unfortunately, what Angela found in the research was that we have this push for STEM and then we have these students are having math anxiety and there's no intervention. So we have the, there's a disconnect there. <clears throat> so she thought, well, there's definitely enough evidence for me to continue the study. These students need it because I want my students to go into whatever field they want to without any anxiety. So I have my problem. Here it is. Here's my problem. Now, what do I do as far as intervention? So again, with some more review of literature, she found that that core piece of anxiety, there was a lot of literature talking about mindfulness-based cognitive therapy to decrease um, forms of anxiety, not specifically math anxiety, but anxiety in general. And so Angela thought, hey, this might be able to be something that I could use. Now, Angela didn't know much about mindfulness, cognitive therapy for children at all, but what she did find was a manualized approach. So this is a very important piece of um, single subject research design if you can find a manualized intervention, it's very important because you can decrease that external validity threat saying, so when you replicate this study, if you use this manualized approach, you have a higher chance of having these same um, outcomes. Um, oftentimes in evident, or excuse me, in manualized approaches, the materials are included. So she saw this manual, she said, okay, I can do this, all the directions are here, it's a manualized approach over the course of six weeks, twice per week. As a counselor, I can schedule this time in. Okay, I think I can do this. And so um, I can't stress enough the importance of you using a manualized approach, if possible, depending on which behaviors you're measuring. Um, so now she says, okay, I know I want to do multiple base. I know I want to do single subject. Um, so which is, what, what kind of single subject design is good for me? And again, look, working with your master's students, working in your, in your clinicals or in the schools, it's really important to have the right research design because as a school counselor, um, if Angela thought she was going to do a controlled group, an experimental group and go in and have all these randomly selected participants, um, it's unrealistic and again acts as a barrier. So if she doesn't think that she is capable because of her um, where her environment, did, where her research environment is at, that 
that's where they'll stop. So again, I have an underlying foundation of advocacy for single subject research under here that I know I keep bringing up, but it's really important to show our students that they can do this, that we can do this and our students can do this. Um, so let's look at her needs. So what are your needs? Well, Angela needed a small number of students to work with because she has a population that she's responsible for of probably 50,000 students. <laughs> okay, that's an exaggeration, but probably more like a thousand, uh, depending on where you're at in the, in the country. And so she doesn't have the capability um, or the space really to work with a large number of students. Um, also needed a short duration of time. Well, the school year is only nine-ish months. Um, but in that, we also have a month of testing. We also have the beginning of the school year month. We have a Christmas break. And so all of these things were factored in. Oh my goodness. She has to do a small, a small amount of time. As clinicians in community settings, you have to do a small amount of time because of insurance and because of, you know, having to see multiple clients and those kinds of things. So, um, also, it was important for Angela to be able to work simultaneously with students, but not necessarily in a group setting. Um, and she needs to use her natural environment. She cannot go to a lab. She can't leave for a few hours a day and go to the lab to do a randomized controlled experiment. So she needs, she also needs to visually show change that can be read by those who are experts in reading research, um, teachers, clinicians, publics, and community, because as clinicians, as school counselors, we are ultimately advocates for our students, for our people. Um, and so it's really important that we're able to communicate any kind of change that we want to make. We found a design. We found concurrent multiple baseline experimental research design across three subjects. Again, we explain what that means in simplistic terms and again, promote that to your students. But this research design is encouraged in the field of school counseling and counseling in general, um, where we need applied research to prove, empirically prove results. So then we had to create a research question. So the research question is, what is the impact of a 12 session mindfulness-based cognitive therapy protocol on math, anxiety, and adolescence? So when I, I'm going to sort of pause right here, and um, at this point, I would like you all to just take a moment and reflect on your own um, ideas of research, on what you want to implement, um, your question, and how it might look like this as, as framed as a hypothesis. So my hope is that going through this, you'll sort of insert your own um, hypotheses, your own um, ways of doing this in here. Does that make sense? All right. So we have our hypotheses. We have mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for children. Again, that manualized approach will decrease feelings of math anxiety in adolescent students. That's what Angela felt like was going to happen in her study. Um, and then of course, our, the null would be that there's no impact. It's important to state those very clearly because when you are showing change, this is the statement that it's all, it's all focused on. And looking at your administrators and your supervisors, this is the change that they're going to want to see. So how are we gonna measure effectiveness? Well, um, you know she wants to measure anxiety. Looking at the research design, she knows she's going to have to obviously um, gather participants that have anxiety. So again, she went back to the literature and found that there were some research-based valid re instruments in, in, in measuring in anxiety. So again, in a single subject research design, this is another really important piece that helps solidify that validity in that in, in addition to having a manualized approach, having a valid measuring tool. Now, observation oftentimes is the measuring tool for um, single subject research design, but if at all possible, you can get a, a tool that is valid and reliable instrument, it will increase your validity and um, 
outcomes. So for here, she needed a research-based measurement to make sure students actually have anxiety, math anxiety. So there is one out there, the Mars A. And then she said, well, now I need a research-based measurement that I can use as a baseline intervention and then looking at measuring throughout my phases. So the Mars A was like a 200 and something question, questionnaire um, uh, measurement. And so that would be unrealistic in, in, in the real world. It's unrealistic to give students during a single subject design a 200 question measuring tool every time you're measuring, right? Um, because our design is based on data points. And so it's really important to <laughs> not um, wear out our participants with a 200 point study or measurement scale. So because of that, um, Angela found a shorter sort of um, uh, formative assessment where we can continually check the progress in a 10, 5 to 10 question um, measurement. And that is the Banama Sherman Mathematics Anxiety Scale. Okay. So there were two, one to actually recruit participants and then one to study the baseline and intervention. So how do we establish a clear criteria for measurement of behaviors? Uh, the first thing is to be very specific in your definition. So when you are creating your con your construct or behavior to measure, it's very important that you have a definition for it. Um, in this case, math anxiety in the literature was defined as feelings of anxiety, dread, nervousness, and bodily symptoms. Um, this is important even when you have a measuring tool such as the Mars A to recruit participants and screen participants because you want to know, they need to know, your participants need to know in this case, what anxiety feels like so that they can identify it and then report their anxiety level. So um, when you are measuring something like that, the literature is very helpful in creating a, a specific definition that can be used across the board. So when possible, again, use your behavior screening tool that's been normed on your focus population. Um, in this case, the Mars A and the Phenoma Sherman Mathematics Anxiety Scale. And then control as much as realistically possible outside influences to your, to your construct during participant selection. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But it's important to be able to control what you can control in our setting. So again, going back to this is not a lab. This is a, a natural setting in which this uh, research occurs. And so there will be some things that you can't control as a researcher. Um, but it's not so much the lack of control that's problematic, it's more um, reporting the lack of control. So if people don't report that lack of control that they have, and then when you try to replicate the study, there are a lot of extraneous factors that we didn't know about. So when you report those results and you report, okay, hey, we had this student and this happened in our school and this is what, you know, went on, um, that will add to the replication of the study. Um, so, with that being said, this is what Angela felt like she could control. Um, this is how she selected the participants and received consent. pre experimental they had to have that screening so that they actually had um, anxiety, uh, enrolled or ninth and 10th grade, so controlling for that, not currently receiving medication, absent no more than previous 30 calendar days so that she could return excuse me, um, ensure that mortality, threat to mortality, willing to participate, obviously they need to be a, a consensual participant. And because these were minors, parents needed to consent as well. And not on a, what, what in the schools is called an individualized education plan or an IEP or part of um, special education programs. So in this instant, is there anything else that you can think of that Angela needed to account for or try to control in participant selection? I am wondering if she could rule out students who, uh, who have been diagnosed with any mental disorder, like depression already. 
then you factor that out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Factoring as much as you can out of the equation so it, it can become cleaner. It's a great, great one. Anything else? Thank you, Hannah. I'm kind of curious about uh, performance in the, the class, uh, mm -hmm. the algebra class, because it's, it's, the presumption is that the math anxiety interferes with performance, but there's a possibility that someone could be high in math anxiety mm -hmm. and still be achieving A's or B's in the course. So would you mm. want to control for, um, you know, folks who are in the lower, like the CD level? Mm. Right. Yeah. Putting that in additionally. It's another good one. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else? So those are some really good additions. And the point being, try to control for as much as you can so that you can isolate that behavior. So now we're going to run through some, um, and Chris, am I doing okay on time? I'm just gonna do a time check. Okay. Doing good. Okay. Um, we're going to run through the threats to internal validity. Um, and again, we'll just quickly run through these. And then if you have questions at the end, we can address those. I wanna make sure I get through all these slides in, in our time period. Um, so replication is really the biggest piece of single subject research designs. Um, that's how experimental control is demonstrated within that replication. So that's really important to keep in the back of our mind um, when we see these threats to internal validity or when we are advocating for single subject research design and someone says, oh my goodness, there are so many threats to validity. We say, well, it's really important to understand that this is a single case design. So we need to replicate it. There's a reason why it's called single case design. <laughs> and so um, really advocating for that replication of the design is very important. So these are just the um, sort of general threats to internal validity that you see in, in, in every study. Um, and so we're gonna go through them one by one and look at them. So, it, it looks as though um, researchers have suggested that history can be assessed and ruled out through interdata series evaluations if data are co collected concurrently. Um, so in changes across data series can indicate a potential threat due to history. And so the history can be ruled out if we have a multiple baseline. So it happened across all boards. So when we're explaining the results, now we know that history affected that. And I like it when you shake your head like this because I feel like you get it. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, uh, maturation. Typically, this isn't a, a huge issue because single subject research design is typically short. Um, so it can be, the, the influence can be on ongoing formative assessment, assessment, excuse me, uh, can be ruled out altogether if there's no trend in the baseline. And if trend does occur within the baseline, then that trend can be forecasted in the intervention phase and considered during interpretation. So again, looking at that maturation saying, I'm going to address this in my interpretation of the, of the results is important. Um, another reason why I think, and this is just one of my little side, side notes that Chris is gonna have to control me on. <laughs> one of my, my advocating for single subject research design is the, the fact that you're able to communicate so much as counselors, you communicate so much about your study that really it can be replicable with all of the understanding during interpretation. Because nothing's perfect. So we just need to communicate that. This is what happened, this is my interpretation. Um, Testing, so sufficient data, data should be collected in order to evaluate any threats due to testing. So um, a student might improve their performance on academic tests, either as a response to observers within the classroom or practice of repeating administration. We hope as researchers that the responsiveness is like will subside and um, then you can assess that threat and possibly rule it. Um, and instrumentation, similarly, when researchers check for observer accuracy, measurement specification, making sure, and that goes back to making sure your, your instrumentation is valid um, and reliable and a, like a good screening tool that you have there. And that helps with your instrumentation validity. Uh, we talked a little bit about mortality in, in, that, in that you might lose some participants, but there's also this piece of some researchers when the levels don't look desirable, 
um, participants are dropped or um, interventions stop and those kinds of things. And so it's really important to, um, if you have some sort of mortality, um, that you want to look at the trend and variability so it can be resolved a lot easier with a concurrent multiple baseline design because they can we can extend the baseline phase so i've got all these students and i'm going to do my baseline phase three six nine days Ooh, i'm not seeing i'm not seeing a whole lot of behavior change or i'm seeing a lot of behavior change that i don't want to see let's just extend that baseline a little bit longer till we can get some stability and that's you can do that as a researcher as an independent researcher in single subject it's not like you have to control 30 people in each group another benefit so that was ex internal validity excuse me and, and these are three specific threats to external validity that really um the best way to ad address is by replicating across different participants different types of participants those kinds of things so that you can look at these trends and behaviors and start to establish a, um, uh, 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 I can't think of the word, but establish that, that trend and behavior across studies. So you have large amounts of evidence. But again, single case replicating studies adds to the external validity. So that all of that was just setting it up. <laughs> Angela's research study phase one is complete. So now she has to put her information through the Institutional Review Board for approval. We all have to go through IRB. If you are not part of an institution, you have to go through independent IRB and pay money. So uh, if you're not part of an institution, partner up with someone who is. <laughs> that's why that's my tip. Um, okay, so IRB. We're still waiting. Still waiting on IRB. We just have to be patient. <laughs> you can tell I've had wonderful experiences with IRB. Oh yay, IRB has approved the study. So Angela goes back to her school. She's so excited. She's jazzed. She says, IRB's approved my study. I've got a solid setup. I've got participants that I'm about to get. I know all of the criteria. I know my design. Woohoo! Now let's conduct the study. See, I'm very excited about research. I'm very excited, as many of you are on this beautiful Saturday morning <laughs> joining me. So there are, so phase two is all about conducting the study. And um, we, the first two steps, recruiting participants and getting that informed consent, and then establishing stability in the baseline. We're going to go over in depth. Um, implementing the intervention, we'll just briefly talk about because the intervention is going to be very different for all of you. So we'll just talk briefly about that one. And I think we're, because of time too. All right. So um, conducting the study. Step one, recruiting the participants. So this, after going through those participant selection criteria, and uh, it took about a week, about a week, for the participants to be selected. And Angela found three participants. Uh, because of the environment and location, the demographics are not as diverse as Angela would have hoped. So that is going to be communicated in the results, in the interpretation of the study. It's very important to note that. Um, especially with single subject when you're replicating. So um, participant one, two, and three, one male, Caucasian, ninth grade student, age 15. This score was a 252 on the math anxiety rating scale. So again, I'm gonna scoop back here to our selection criteria and you're going to see that the student needed to have at least a 229. So at least a 229 is, is what, we were hoping to get for selection participant criteria. So this student is a 252. Um, so yeah, this student qualifies. And then our second student was a 245, absolutely. And then the third student was a female, and she scored a 328. This student has very physical, visible signs of math anxiety, and her score on the Mars rating scale reflected that. Um, 
In other mathematics courses, and this is important to know also isolating that behavior of math anxiety, in the other courses, these students maintained above average grades in their middle school and high school, but were failing math. So these are students who particularly and historically perform very well in school. So again, adding to their anxiety. Now I'm failing a class and I don't even know what that feels like. So it's very important and I bring that up because it's really important as single subject to know your participants as much as, and when I say know your participants, know their behaviors, know their background. Um, and again, this is why it's such a huge research um, design that can be used in counseling because we know our students, we know our clients, um, and it just fits so well. So we're going to um, step two, establishing stability. Now, I will say of, of all of the steps in conducting the study and, and establishing it, this one is a really huge one because this is where you start to be able to show your change in behavior. So looking at visual comparison is really what single subject baseline is based on. We, we visually look at differences. So it's really important for our baseline phase to look different than our intervention phase if we're going to show results. So when I say stable, I mean limited variability. We want the range of, in baseline, we want the range of our future data points to be predictable. I wanna say, you have math anxiety today, tomorrow, the next day, and I'm going to predict that you have them in the next, the following days. So if we um, do that, then we know that when we implement the intervention and there's change, we have more confidence to say it was because of the intervention. And Going along with that, a minimum of three baseline points are required to establish a dependent measure st stability. Three, but more is preferable. So the more, I always say, the more you can do to establish a baseline, the more evidence you have that your intervention's working. So if it's not established in the initial sessions, then measure more, give some more time, and sometimes it just needs time. For this particular study, so going back to Angela, we have participant A was going to be measured their math anxiety level for five days in a row. During the same time period, participant B was going to be measured eight days. And for participant C, we have 11 days. So why are we giving multiple days? Why aren't we just giving them all the same day? Anyone know the answer to that question? Or want to take a I was actually just going to ask you why the different measuring days, but I guess it's because of their unique differences and possibly their, their anxiety scores. Maybe, I don't know. Anyone else? So it really is to show that evidence of change. So let me give you an example. If all of the participants had a baseline of five days, and then I did the intervention. Angela did the intervention. And the behaviors changed. One could possibly say it's because of outside influence, right? It's because of change of this, 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 and this. If I have the participants at different baselines, and then right when the intervention goes, they see change, it's very hard to say that the change was due to outside influences when we have multiple baselines and they're showing stability and then change with the intervention. Does that make sense? All right, Hannah's got a head nod. <laughs> okay, any other questions about that? It's really important to focus on that stability of the baseline. I have a quick question, Dr. Lagu. Is sure. that the difference between a concurrent and non-concurrent multiple baseline when the intervention beginning is staggered after the baseline? It's, it's not, that's, it's okay. a great question because it, it, you would think that that would be, but really non-concurrent and current. And this is, um, in the literature, this is still a controversial sort of debatable, non-concise definition of con concurrent and non-concurrent. But basically it's, if, are they happening in the same time period in the same environment? That's concurrent. Okay. And are they happening in different time periods? Um, and so if I were to do a study at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, uh, that would be a non-concurrent. 
Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification, that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so step three, inter in implementing the intervention. Again, remember, we're using a manualized approach to um, handle some of those threats to validity that we've got. We've got this manualized approach. It can be replicated within our field. And, and let me go back to this. Real life, this is doable. This is doable for a counselor. This is a session of counseling. This is a session at a school. Um, so again, applicable, realistic, doable. And that's important for our students to know. Okay, any questions about phase two implementing? All right, let's just keep on moving forward then. Analyzing the reports, uh, analyzing the study, excuse me. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about concerns with implementing inferential statistics, visual analysis, percentage of overlapping data, and then spread in the love of single subject design. All right, so everyone's question is, typically, when you talk about single subject research design, how do I analyze that in a statistical method? Okay, well, there are a couple sort of messy answers to that because um, one of the tools that usually helps us look at what works in the field is our meta-analysis, right? So we read a lot of meta-analysis. Oh, there were these 50 studies and they talked about this, 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 and this. And so we have a lot of what works in the field as to our evidence-based. The issue with single subject research design is there's not typically a, an agreed metric or effect size calculation. So it's really hard to group studies together as a meta-analysis and say this is what works because you have so many different um, effect sizes. So the proposed solution of implementing conventional inferential statistical tests like t-tests and those kinds of things, ANOVAs, um, they are prone to type one error because of autocorrelation. Okay, so we all know that means that the point before could affect the point after, those kinds of things. So because of that, we typically analyze the results in two ways. And this actually is a very, I, I should note, this is a very growing field um, because what, what the field is seeing, the field of single subject research design is seeing is that everyone wants statistical results. And so the, the emphasis on statistics are just the be all end all of research, it, it needs to dissipate a little bit and we need to be able to trust our visual analysis because it's not, it doesn't always have to be the t-test that tells us the truth. Um, so again, in counseling, it's very individualized. So that's again, single subject is important. So we do a visual analysis. Let me just talk quickly about visual analysis. Um, we just are looking at the, the data series. We're analyzing the mean within phases and between phases. So is there a difference? We look at the slope of the line. So when we're looking at behavior change, is it deteriorating? Is it flat line? Is it consistent? We wanna describe it. We wanna be very descriptive about our, our data. And is there a deviation of data around our best fit line? So when we have our best fit slope, is there a data line that drops below here, up here? Those kinds of things. For example, in um, Angela's research, a data line dropped really low. And so what that meant in the research was that for that particular week, all of those students tested high, unusually high in math anxiety. So, when the researcher, Angela, went back and tried to figure out what was going on here, she found out that they all had a test that week in algebra. They all had a, so the outside influence, we can discuss, we can talk about when we're looking at inconsistencies and variabilities in the lines. It's a really cool piece of single subject um, because it almost tells a story. It tells a story without telling a story, without being quali you know, that qualitative piece. Um, and so we want to um, look at change. Visual analysis is all about looking at change. This one, this, this way of analyzing results to me is, um, if people wanna see numbers, this is the best way to do it. And it's not a difficult way, but it is the best way to report data in which people can feel like that, that confidence and safety in numbers. And so um, it's called 
calculating the percentage of non-overlapping data. And it's easy to calculate by hand. So practitioners, our counselors, they can do that. They don't have to go hire a statistic, statistician. You don't have to put it through you know, Excel and do some big formula. It's really, it's the most base, extreme baseline data point is selected. And then the number of data points that fall above or below the line is tallied and divided by the intervention data points. Um, so let me give you an example. In a study of a treatment designed to increase communication fluency, eight of the 10 data points found the intervention phase are greater in value than the largest baseline data point. That makes sense? Eight of the 10, and so the percentage of non-overlapping data, data that did not overlap with that baseline is 80%. That's a, the bigger the percentage of overlapping data, the better your study is. Non-overlapping data is the better your study is. So if I had, um, a, a points, nine of them were above the baseline, I would be at 90% percentage of non-overlapping data. The higher the better. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Any questions about that? So sometimes people look at and they're like, wait, 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 that seems way too easy to calculate. Wait, you just count the point, the data points above the baseline, and then you tell me that, and really it is, it is that Simple, because we're doing a visual analysis of our individualized data. Remember, this is individualized. April, thank you so much for going over the analysis. I, I'm curious as well, um, one of the things that I've been using kind of uh, PEM or using the, the, uh, the median as kind of that source of the data point, is are there uh -huh. any kind of advantages or disadvantages you see to PND versus PEM? Um, uh, it depends, I guess, if your baseline, how, if your baseline is long and stable, I would choose the medium of the stability of the baseline. I'm assuming that's what you did for the median line. We did, and you know, I, I really liked having these multi, uh, having each participant have these multiple uh, links of baselines. It, I, when we did this study, we had a, a, a five-point uh, baseline for everybody because it was such a, it was kind of a standardized group they went along within. And I can mm -hmm. see one of the advantages because we did see a lot of bumping up and down. Just you, it was it was very difficult to see. Yeah, yeah, that that definitely the the different um, baseline data points helps a lot with that. Um, but you know, talking about your median point, that is one of the potential issues for P and D is that if you have this outlier of data and you're going through that last, you know, the most extreme baseline point because that's where you start from then there is an issue there that couldn't, that might not reflect your data accurately. So going with the median point, absolutely, if there are some outliers and things like that, again, individualized, going with that. So um, looking at the participants, the research study was complete, the intervention was um, integrated into the, uh, the school for the, for the student, and here are the results. So for participant A, the mean baseline, excuse me, I have a, you guys are all covering my <laughs> movie over here. Okay, so the mean baseline on the score was 10.8. Visual analysis trend, if you look at it, we're gonna discuss the visual analysis trend. And that was improving, we call that improving and consistent. So just looking at that data, we call it improving and consistent. And then we, we calculated the percentage, the PND, and that was 67%, which is good. So again, you can visually see the data, but you can also show the number of PND, 67%. The second participant similarly um, have this mean baseline of eight points um, on the scale. So that's the scale that was continued, they were continuously measured throughout the every week, once a week throughout the intervention, they had this Banama Sherman scale and scored on that. So when I say mean baseline, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and a visual analysis again, trend improving consistent and percentage of non-overlapping data, 67%. And you can see in both of these data points where these students had their algebra tests. So in this data, the line going up is reflecting of decreased anxiety. So it's a little, you gotta kind of switch your brain a little bit there. Um, so the point going down is actually increased anxiety there in the middle. 
Okay, so then the, um, the, for the third participant, now remember this is our participant who had the highest score on the Mars A. She was really had some physical signs of math anxiety um, and really responded well to the intervention. Look at that beautiful line, improving, consistent, and percentage of overlapping data was 100%, meaning that as soon as that intervention was introduced, the student responded amazing to it, which is really exciting. So again, uh, the reason why single subject is so magnificent in our field of counseling is because these are three very different students, very different students, but they use their own behavior as a control. So I don't have to compare them to other students. I compare them to themselves. And that's a really exciting piece in our field. Any questions about the data, data points, baseline? Uh, I have a question here. So I'm looking sure. at this visual uh, data. And, and so on X axis, you are showing the level of anxiety. Uh -huh. On the Y axis, you are showing the weeks, like yes. first week, second week, Day. third week, fourth week. Yeah, those are the days. Those are days. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Uh huh. Okay, so um, spread in the love of single subject research design. And this is a, a piece that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I would love to do a future webinar on just how to report data and work with the community and policymakers and grant writing and those kinds of things um, to really advocate for this in our profession. Um, but for purposes of this webinar, um, looking at grant funding. So again, that catch 22, I don't have funding, but I need funding. And so doing a single subject research design is a really um, applicable, easy way to be able to get that little foot in the door so that I can show a little bit of change and then we get some seed funding for grants and then we can show bigger change by replicating your study. Um, policy change. So in this, um, I'll give you an example. So uh, this example of math anxiety going in and saying our students should have some sort of behavioral intervention between middle school and freshman year to decrease math anxiety or it should be assessed you know, change of policy, it should be assessed in middle school and those kinds of things. That is why that study was done, to change policy on big picture. Imagine how many students will be, will have a different experience with math based on these three students' intervention because of policy change. It's really powerful. It's really powerful to think about as an advocate. Um, and then identity development. So specifically with school counselors, we are uh, known to do pretty much everything. Uh, wear about 100 different hats and do everything in the kitchen sink. And so because of that, the, the definition of a professional school counselor sometimes get convoluted and lost in the um, translation. So being a researcher, being an advocate, oh, you need to look at change in behavior. Our school counselor does that. Our school counselor's done those studies. You need to look at um, change so for our policy for our community setting. Oh, we know someone, a counselor who's really good at that and who can read data and on an individualized basis, understanding that all of our students and community are individual clients. Um, and then again, if you want to add to evidence-based um, research, this is a really good way to get started. Now, evidence-based research doesn't have to be control, experimental, and all of those really exciting, fun things about research that take up a lot of time and money and people and resources, because we just don't have them in our social sciences profession right, right now. Um, so, but when you go out to uh, write a grant, you have to typically write a logic model that shows the behaviors you're going to decrease, and almost all the time they want you using, especially now, an evidence-based approach right, to get that funding. So it's really important that we add these P's to our profession so that we can increase those fundings for the evidence-based approaches. So with that being said, there are a couple slides here that I'm not gonna go too into, too deep into, but I want to um, advocate that as single subject design researchers, because we, that is an identity that you have, um, we can make it into the clearinghouse of what works. Um, so they say, this, these are the guidelines, minimum of five supporting studies, meeting evidence standards are to be combined into a single summary. 
They have to be conducted by three different research teams, three different geographical locations, and have a combined of 20 participants. Now, if you think about that, that's really pretty doable. It's pretty doable. A team of researchers gets together and, you know, does a few studies. And really, it's, it's as I hope you just saw, very doable within the field of counseling also. Um, and so here real quick is just the summary of what works criteria. So when you're going through and you're looking at um, what do I need to make sure I include my study so that I can put it up for an evidence-based approach, these are just the guidelines. And again, these are on the um, IES uh, website for, for you. And something I just realized is I didn't include my reference page. So I'm going to have to have Chris send that to you all out as well. Um, that's it. So I hope I left time for discussion, Chris. Yeah, we're a little uh, short on time, but we have uh, about six minutes to have a quick discussion, question, answer. Um, okay. So yeah, maybe we could open up to the floor and see who has comments, cool. questions. I have a question regarding the acceptance of single uh, case research design in the research in journals, what is their approach to this particular research design? Are they very receptive in the field of counseling or they are like, no, it's just for, you know, um, if you want to start something, you can start with this, but we are not going to publish your findings. I mean, mm. overall in the field of counseling, what, what do you see the receptiveness of such studies That's for it. publication? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm glad that you went there because um, it varies because single subject design is not a new field in psychology. Uh, as you probably know, there, you know, with ABA and all of the behavioral analysis and those kinds of things, it's um, pretty, pretty um, fluent in, in, in psychology. So the counseling field uh, isn't up to the psychology part as far as using single subject design. But I do see more studies coming out as research has become an identity, more of an identity of counselors. So I think looking at the span of time um, and the evolution of counseling identity, really, you know, there was a counseling practitioner and now there's the advocate researcher, you know, um, going out in the field and actually doing those, those things. Um, so the, they are increasing in acceptance of publications um, with single subject research design in counseling journals. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely moving up for sure. It's a good question. I have a question, Dr. Legu, about um, to, in the participant selection in the example, you gave sort of a broader assessment or mm -hmm. Angela gives a broader assessment of a 200, <laughs> 200 question. Uh, math anxiety assessment. Is there, and it may not be the norm, but is there value for single subject research designers to go back and, and rerun that assessment post-treatment to see a, a broader change? And does that reporting strengthen the results of the, the intervention? Or is that kind of a little too flimsy in terms of uh, threats to validity there? Yeah, I don't know. I think that um, with single subject, one of the things I love about it is that you can play around with it. And because you don't have to have this controlled and experiment and all of these really strict guidelines, you can add some qualitative pieces in there and you can add some follow-up stuff. So in this particular case, um, there was a follow-up measurement, but it wasn't included into the study because of those uh, external validity threats. Because you don't, you know, there are tons of things that could have happened between the two-week follow-up but all students did still reflect a decrease in their anxiety after a two-week follow-up with that measurement tool. So it's, it's good to note that you can qualitatively add that into your discussion. Additionally, each of the students were interviewed and that qualitative piece was um, considered. So the students talked about, reflected on their experience and how they, they named specifically a couple pieces of mindfulness that they took away from it that they used to decrease their um, anxiety with regards to math. So that qualitative piece when you're presenting to the public or that is really powerful, that, that piece. So that personal connection that people get, you don't typically get with a traditional research design, but with single subject, you can throw that qualitative piece in there and it really adds to the, the um, emphasis of, of the change that you're trying to make. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And I'm noticing our time here. I, yeah. If we could make it, I don't know if anyone has a quick burning question they need to ask, and maybe they could, if they have a remaining questions, would it be okay to uh, have them email you, Dr. Lagu, or they could email me and I could email you. I don't know how we'd, we'd do Either that. way. You're more than welcome to email me absolutely anytime. If you have questions and you're in the middle of a study and you, you're stuck, please email me. I love to um, work with this design and working on different modalities and with different issues. It's definitely a passion of mine. So please reach out to me or Chris. Um, and I really appreciate you all being here on Saturday. I really do. I, I'm so happy that we have counselors in our field that are going to make change with this research design. I really believe in it. So thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you, Dr. Lagu, for your time and effort in putting this together. And I almost uh, want to do another webinar just on the, the part three, the visual analysis. I find that so fascinating, yeah, all the yeah. different ways to interpret the data there. Um, Absolutely. And on the surface, it looks uh, pretty straightforward, but when you dig into it, there's, there's a lot you can yeah, see from yeah. the information. All right, just a couple of housekeeping notes from uh, CRLL before we close very uh, briefly. We're going to have a link to a survey that's coming out, and we'd appreciate uh, folks filling out the survey. It's, it's very brief and letting us know your feedback, including future topics that you might like us to um, arrange with CRLL. Uh, so that would be very useful. So be looking for that. I'll also send out, I think Dr. Lagu is going to send me her PowerPoint and her references. So that will be included in that email. Um, mm -hmm. Coming up, we have Dr. Kakman Ung. He's going to be doing an internationalization of the counseling profession, CRL presentation mid-July. And Dr. Cass Dykman is scheduled to do a presentation on corpus linguistic analysis, which is just an Ooh. absolutely fascinating field. And that's scheduled November. And they will be having other presentations uh, scheduled in between there. Uh, if you have any questions or feedback, I can be reached via email anytime. Many thanks again to Dr. Lagu and all who attended. And we hope to see you and your colleagues. And please let your colleagues know about our program. We hope to see folks in the future uh, attend and participate. This has been absolutely fantastic today. Awesome. So thank, thank you, you Chris. so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful Saturday and good end of your quarters. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye.